as a neurobiologist and in some sense a comparative neurobiologist, I like to step back and say, you know, what what is a species, uh, you know, trying to optimize for? It sounds like a lot of what we were trying to optimize for throughout human history is to limit discomfort um, and, of course, ensure the species persists, so reproduction is key, and then making sure that our offspring, which need a lot of care over a long period of time compared to other species, are taken care of. Like when you step back as like pure evolutionary lens, yeah. um, it, to me, it seems pretty much that simple. Uh, and all the rest is noise, as they say. So if our goal in human evolution is to rid ourselves of discomfort and make things easier and safer and propagate the species, then why at some point is more comfort bad for us? There are side effects that happen, right? Um, and when you look at most of the diseases that kill us today, they are a result of usually overconsumption of food, right? We eat too much, uh, far more than we often need. Um, we don't move enough. There's a lot tied to sort of metabolic health. And so I think that I put this in the, I, I like to say, these are good problems to have in the grand scheme of time and space, right? I would prefer to have my problem be that, oh, I have to go exercise or something to take care of my physical activity than the fact that like, oh, I have to, I have to go hunt and gather every single day like to get my food. But I do think that they are problems that we need to solve. The fact that, you know, a lot of our modern problems are driven by the fact that our environments have become so comfortable. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that, that answers the question. I, I heard someone say recently that a lot of what exists now in health and wellness is just trying to bring the outdoors indoors. Yeah. So I, I've tried to persuade, as everyone knows, people to get outside in the morning, get sunlight in their eyes for mm -hmm. all sorts of reasons. Um, but, you know, the whole business with red light, you know, long wavelength light, infrared light, you can use one of those panels. It can be quite useful. There's also a lot of long wavelength light coming from the sun. Mm -hmm. um, fresh air, we could debate grounding, um, but many people believe it's helpful. Uh, green spaces. I mean, it, I kind of agree with this idea that, you know, so much of what we're encouraging people to do is just... Um, mimic doing what we used to do all the time. It's what life used to be, right? We, like I said, we spend 100% of our time in the outdoors. We evolved in the outdoors. That is kind of like our natural environment. And I think um, to continue with this example, when you put us in four walls where we don't get that outdoor exposure, some interesting psychological things start to happen that probably aren't that good for us. Um, and this, you can apply this idea to everything. Like I said, like even physical activity, it's like exercise is a great example to me. No one exercised in the past, right? Exercise is something that we made up basically after the industrial revolution, because what happened is we get these jobs where now we're much more sedentary and we start to realize, oh, these people who have the jobs where they sit all day, they're getting these strange new health problems that we've never seen and yet the people who are kind of moving around all day still in their jobs, they don't seem to get those problems. So maybe activity is the difference maker. Hey, you guys that are sitting all day, I want you to just go move around for the sake of it. No, there's no actual point to it. Just like move around for the sake of it. That'll improve your health. And this becomes this idea of, of exercise, movement for the sake of it, which is this kind of strange idea in the grand scheme of time and space. But it does make sense in the context of a world where the average American is walking, you know, 4,000 to 6,000 steps a day. That's how we get our activities. We have to manufacture it effectively. And I will say though, to continue with your example of that, how we sort of uh, mimic what we used to do in the past. Um, I do think that when we, we try to solve for these problems, sometimes uh, the way we do it is sort of interesting. We go, okay, if we need to move more, well, what if we got, um, what if we got a belt and we put a motor on it and a person could just run on this belt in this air conditioned building. Oh, and, and then we'll put a television there. And that way you can just watch CNN blare insane information into your face the entire time and be totally distracted. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. But when we do that, what are we missing? So when a person runs outdoors on the other hand, let's say it's on a trail, well, now you have all these other forms of discomfort and stimulation that are coming your way. So one, you've got the physical activity, obviously, but two is that the trail isn't this perfectly predictable thing, right? If I'm on the treadmill, I can go, okay, 1% incline, I'm gonna run six miles an hour, and I just do that, I don't have to think about it. Well, the trail 
It's going to go up and down. You're going to have rocks and ruts you have to navigate under. That's a mental challenge. You're also going to have to think about the weather. Right now, oh, I have to deal with the temperature changes. Oh, that looks like a storm might be coming in. There's also so much more that you take in from the environment. You're running through trees. You run into open spaces. And that has, I think, a real emotional, and I would say even spiritual benefit from that nature. You're going to see totally random things, right? Like my favorite thing is when I go run on trails in Las Vegas. And like you see that random coyote or the bighorn sheep, and it's just like, this is it. Mountain lion? Mountain lion. Right. Have, you, have you seen mountain lions? I've seen them other places, but not in Vegas, unfortunately. Most people would say, fortunately, I'm on the other side. Like, mountain lion's not going to hurt you. But if you get to see one, that's an opportunity. I don't know, that video of that kid in Colorado, you know, where it's chasing him. Oh, yeah, yeah. Or, or stalking <laughs> him. Uh, and we could talk about that. I totally agree. I think that um, optic flow that uh, of the sort that you get out when you're hiking or walking or cycling or um, more dangerous activity like motorcycling out of doors um, – we know that it has a powerful effect in suppressing some of the areas of the brain involved in fear. I don't know if you're familiar with mm. this literature, but Francine Shapiro, who was um, actually ran her clinic behind Stanford uh, for a while, who came up with EMDR, this eye movement uh, desensitization uh, reprocessing for trauma, um, came up with that on a walk and developed the lateral eye movements that are the cornerstone of EMDR as a way to bring the walk into her clinic. Interesting. Because, uh, and then for years I would hear about this and I thought it was complete garbage. I was like this, there's, as a neuroscientist, I was like, the, no. And people would say, oh, you know, the eye movements mimic rapid eye movements in sleep. That's why it works. And it, no, they don't look anything like the rapid eye movements in sleep, by the way. But they'd say, oh, you know, it's um, creating cross hemisphere uh, activation of the two sides of the brain. Uh, no. I mean, you get that if you have binocular vision, you know, vision scientists. I was like, no, that's ridiculous. But and somewhere around 2016 to 2020, there were four papers and then an additional paper in animal, uh, an animal study. So some, there's a mix of animal and human data showing that when um, animals or humans engage in this uh, lateralized re repetitive eye movement back and forth, that it suppresses, among other areas, the amygdala. Mm -hmm. So amygdala activation you know, troughs. And so there's something about forward ambulation, nerd speak for walking and running, yeah. right? That um, suppresses the, the fear areas of the brain. And I'm convinced that this is a, a, a central reason why movement out of doors is so fundamentally different on our psyche um, and our level of calm uh, as compared to running on a treadmill or, um, God forbid, just sitting at a desk all day. Yeah. And that makes sense. And I would wonder evolutionarily if that would be um, for hunting. So something like persistence hunting, right? That's a dangerous act. Yes, you have to hunt every single day. That's how you're going to survive to get that food. At the same time, it's still very perilous, right? You're not walking down to Walmart mm -hmm. and getting stuff. And so if you had that fear suppression in the context of an act that is somewhat dangerous, that would probably give you an advantage to actually end up taking down that animal. Huge. There's a, a video of a, um, some hunters. It appears to be in Africa. Forgive me uh, for not knowing exactly where it was. Um, prepared to essentially walk towards a group of lions that have, have are on a kill and the lions look up from the kill and there are these hunters walking like with spears vertical right and the, the lions are like wait what's going on here you know typically this is the other uh, the, the scenario is the other way around are you familiar with this video no. and the, the hunters they're translating into the captions and assuming it's accurate they're saying you know it's key that we just keep moving forward and that confuses the lions and they think that you know that because we're continuing to look at them and move forward, they'll move off the kill. But if we avert our, our gaze, then they won't and we can get attacked and it's happened before. And they literally walk these lions off the kill. And the lions are, you can see that they're, they're perplexed, but like they're like, these guys aren't afraid at all. And they just sort of start backing away. And a couple of them are negotiating in their minds, you can see. And they basically walk these lions off the kill and take the kill. And there's so much going on there that, but it relates to what we're talking about. But Forward ambulation uh, yeah. in the context of hunting, I, I, I agree with you. I think it could have um, uh, huge implications. Also a great metaphor for life right mm -hmm. there, right? It's like mm -hmm. just keep moving forward. If you just kind of focus on the kill, as it were, and just keep moving forward, don't hesitate. Like that can get you pretty far.